I know there's a good buzz in the room and there's so much to talk about and that's always the challenge with um, with organizing these days um, because we want to we want to um, include all the information that we think people need to know about it, but the opportunities to connect and network and spark ideas off each other is actually invaluable. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more time at lunch than we had at break. Um, so right now I'm going to introduce uh, John Audick again from, um, from OCAL, who has been the uh, ambassador and whatever, the, the uh, one-man show practically, although lots of other people are involved in the Mental Injury Toolkit from OCAL, and then Terry Aversa, who's the uh, chair of the Mental Injury Toolkit Advisory Committee and also has been e extensively involved she, uh, in, um, in the implementation of the MIT in many workplaces in Ontario. And she's from OPSU. I didn't mention that before. So although we've uh, shown on the program sort of three different elements to this, we, it's actually been mashed together and, uh, and will be amalgamated. So there's, there's some information and then um, a bit of a workshop and then also some, um, some information testimonials even on how the MIT's been used in different workplaces and, and how successful it's been. And, and of course what that means for the stress assess because this is the background information related to the stress assess product. So here's John. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Val, and thank you, Terry. Yeah, as as uh, Val said, we're, we've kind of taken all the next three items on the agenda and mixed them up, so uh, they're all there. They'll just be uh, uh, the way we want to uh, outline it. Is uh, first of all, is very important uh, as I showed you with the wheel. It's very important to learn and, and get a good grounding in this. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on background and perspectives, kind of building on what Fergal had talked about. And uh, magnitude of the problem, um, I've got uh, some statistics that haven't been shown yet. <laughs> so uh, regulatory responses. Uh, we heard the minister announce that uh, the WSIB will now recognize chronic stress. So uh, that's, that's a big thing to talk about. Also look at some other jurisdictions, uh, what they're doing. Uh, the Mental Injury Tool Group, Activities and Tools. At this point, Terry will give you a bit of background on our group and how we were established and what we've produced. Uh, we talk about a uh, cross-Canada survey and some of the results and some of the practical aspects of using the tool and a few case studies. And then we want you to get involved in brainstorming some solutions. So first, a bit of uh, Psych 101. Uh, behavioralism is one of the uh, oldest uh, views in, in psychology that looked at, uh, of the three things that we look at when we look at uh, psychology, the person, the behavior, and the environment, uh, behavioralism, in a sense, thought that, uh, you know, we don't know what's going inside the person's uh, brains. Uh, we don't have access to that, so we'll put that in a black box and we'll see what, how we can manipulate the environment to produce the behaviors we like. We can give rewards, we can punish, and uh, in a sense, that's also a, a bit of what's behind the uh, behavior-based safety, uh, the type of thinking. Now, the other, another approach was called the transactional theory, and uh, this is what Fergal talked about, uh, about styles of coping. And here we're talking about uh, resilient employees, and this is especially in this new form in positive psychology, where we want to look at what makes a thriving person thrive and try to reproduce that in the non-thriving people. And uh, it's also the basis of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, another approach, which is probably the most comprehensive one, uh, which was actually um, put out by a, a Canadian, Albert Van Duer, is called Reciprocal Determinism. And if you look at this, you see um, we have arrows here, but all, both, uh, all the arrows have uh, arrows on both ends, and they're all connected. And what that's, this means is that it's not just the environment that uh, drives behavior, but the behavior drives environment. And all you have to do is look at your uh, 
if you have young kids in the house, look at their bedroom after they've had a good time. <laughs> you know what the environment looks like. The environment affects the person and the person affects the environment back and forth. And the person obviously uh, has behaviors, but the type, if you force people into certain behaviors, uh, you know, work requires you to greet everybody at the Walmart door with a smile, uh, that affects the person too. So uh, it's all connected in either way. And then you get the question, what about the cause and effect? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, with these two, uh, two arrowed uh, lines connecting these items, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the reason it doesn't matter is if I have a headache and, uh, you know, then I go to work and I get stressed, my, my headache gets worse. If I don't have a headache and I go to work and I get stressed and then I get a headache, I've got a headache, and the two are connected, there's a feedback loop. And I can either, uh, you know, give myself a couple aspirins to try to deal with the headache, or I can try to deal with the stress and reduce the headache that way. So where is it easiest to intervene? Well, sometimes it's easiest just to give somebody a pill and hope it goes away, but that's not really solving the problem. So uh, this is the question we have to deal with when we're dealing with uh, psychosocial hazards in the workplace. And from health and safety, uh, we heard of the hierarchy of controls, where we prefer to eliminate the hazard. If not, then substitute uh, engineering controls, administrative controls. And the last and the least attractive solution is dealing uh, with some type of protective equipment on the worker. If we transpose that to uh, mental injuries in the workplace, uh, hopefully we can uh, adopt the the same hierarchy. Also in health and safety, we have these, this continuum. Oh, well, oh, at the source is where the hazard is. It travels along a path and then it gets received by a worker. And you can uh, illustrate this as source, path, exposure, and then the uptake of the hazard and some biological change. And for uh, chemicals, for instance, you have a source that disperses that's a chemical into the environment, it gets mixed into the ventilation system, it reaches the worker, they inhale it and the lungs absorb it and then it gets stored into some target organ and causes a problem there. With noise you have a vibration that gets transmitted through the air or through the floor and it's heard as noise by the person, it affects their hearing. If they expose for a long time it can lead to noise induced hearing loss. And with ergonomics too, you have repetitive motion that's absorbed into the body and uh, this leads to pain and then that can be a chronic condition with musculoskeletal disorders. I want, uh, Fergal also talked about primary and secondary prevention and I want to talk about all three here, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and to try to put it on the same um, continuum that we're talking about in in traditional health and safety. And so what uh, primary prevention is at is kind of like at the source and for psychosocial hazards it means job redesign, organizational adaptions, flexibilities. Those workplaces that have unions would have uh, an avenue of collective agreements but also you could have policies and programs, a health and safety committee or a wellness committee, all those types of organizations within the workplace can deal with it. Secondary prevention is trying to, uh, when people are exposed and they're starting to uh, feel the impacts of it, to educate people about what the symptoms are and, and how to improve their coping skills, wellness programs, screening. Tertiary prevention is uh, also very important and especially now that uh, the WSIB is going to recognize chronic stress that's important because without recognition that a condition is work-related, there's no impetus for the workplace to try to address it. And that's why it's so important to also have tertiary prevention, where we realize that the problem that people have has a connection to the workplace. And we have the old adage that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's why we try to move up the scale uh, the best prevention is always primary prevention. So if we adapt this uh, scale to the psychosocial hazards, 
we have organizational culture and structures at the workplace that are the the source of stress uh, how to um, manage that is by redesigning the workplace uh, then at the exposure you have the individual reporting uh, uptake the analogy would be screening for for problems and uh, the biological change is the diagnosis and recognition by the WSIB. Now there are different perspectives in how to deal with this and the traditional one is the psychology where you look at what's going on between people's ears, what's going on in their heads and uh, try to make the intervention there and that's changing the coping skills, the cognitive behavioral therapy are all about what's going on in your mind. Psychosocial, on the other hand, is looking at what's going on in your mind, but also how that interacts with the environment. Remember the triangle there, we have three areas that are interacting, uh, going both ways. And that's a more complex uh, model, but it also implies different types of interventions. The standard uh, is interesting because uh, we heard from the people who were at the table developing the standard that they used the word psychosocial in one of the early drafts, but they decided to replace the word psychosocial with the word psychological wherever it occurred. And that has an important implication for, for uh, how you're going to deal with, with these things. Because, uh, you know, the old adage, when all you have is a hammer, then all your problems look like nails. Well, if all you're doing is looking at what's going on inside John's head, well, then you're going to think resiliency, coping skills, cognitive behavioral therapy, and mindfulness. Uh, Dr. David Prosen is a doctor who's in Oakville who has a practice seeing individuals dealing with stress. And he wrote a book. It's called, Is Work Killing You? A Doctor's Prescription for Treating Workplace Stress. It wasn't the first book that he wrote. Um, the first book he wrote was trying to give his patients some idea of how to deal with stress. So it was a how-to book. But uh, I want to read this uh, for you because what he came to the conclusion of is that his, his patients were doing everything that uh, he, his book told them to do, but they were still stressed. So he looked at the problem a little harder, and this is what he came to the conclusion of. The first book ran the risk of being seen as blaming the victim, although fortunately no one took it that way. This book runs the risk of blaming the organization for all the, the stress. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It's a shared responsibility. But I have observed that an increasing amount of stress in recent years has been company driven and organizations are doing precious little to own up to the damage that they're causing on a daily basis. If you haven't read his book, it has a lot of great uh, uh, suggestions on how to how an organization can deal with stress. One of his suggestions is turn off the uh, email server at 6.30 on Friday and don't turn it on till 6 o'clock on, on uh, Monday morning. Mental health first aid, um, I've been trained, uh, so it's a great program if you want to uh, really learn how to uh, associate with someone and be of, of useful help to someone who, who's struggling. And that's not only at work, it's also at home, it's in, in your, your uh, larger social network. However, if we use the analogy to health and safety again, if we had a high rate of injuries in the workplace, would the solution be to train more people to in first aid? Yes, that would be a help. And, Training people in first aid raises awareness on the health and safety and can lead to other prevention, but uh, we can think also beyond uh, this. So what we're really doing is looking for the cause. And uh, with that, Bill 132, which deals with uh, sexual harassment and violence in the workplace, uh, and its precursor, Bill 168 was largely uh, due to the, re the reaction to Lori DuPont's murder. Um, and when they, when they reviewed that situation, they actually found that uh, there were 84 times that the organization could have done something to stop it. 
Yet when they did their own internal review, they came to the conclusion there was nothing that we could have done. Now, the thing about the issue was that in the inquest, they found out that she, Lori DuPont repeatedly shunned help or attention in her situation. And the Ontario Nurses Association, who, who represented uh, Lori, also came to the conclusion uh, that this legislation, while it, it's great to have a process to deal with it, the process doesn't necessarily guarantee that people will be better off. In fact, if the process you know, doesn't work extremely well, it may actually discourage people from, from reporting. So rather than being a complaint-driven uh, program, they suggested we need to be hazard-based. So how would this look? Well, for instance, Bill 132 looks at the exposure. If somebody's exposed to bullying or sexual harassment or violence, uh, it's up to them to report it. If there's no reporting, there's no problem, presumably. Now, a couple of years ago, the health and safety partners uh, Ashko got together and they put together an excellent book on how to develop uh, a, health and, uh, a workplace violence and harassment uh, policies and programs. It's a workbook that's online. I think there's also an interactive website. Um, and it looks at how you can design the workplace so it will be safer. Uh, for instance, if people are selling um, things interacting with the public, you can put barriers and shields and, and you can uh, set up buddy systems so that people working alone will, will have some connection and things like that. And uh, again, that's along the path. But the thing that's missing from all these is what is the source? What, what is causing uh, this type of behavior to be allowed to uh, establish itself in the workplace? And uh, cause the damage it's doing. Now when we look at prevention, uh, this is a, a matrix that uh, Terry uh, put together and uh, it's been fabulous. I've been using it for, for many years now. But we can break things down into the three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary, but we can also split it up into the individual and the organizational. So if you're looking at primary uh, prevention for the individual, you're looking at building people's ability to handle stress with coping skills, appraisal skills, resiliency. Oops. Oh, boy. That was quick. Sorry. <laughs> now if I can find my... Don't look. <laughs> okay secondary wellness things is relaxation mindfulness techniques and things like that we've already heard about some of those programs and tertiary if somebody is suffering from a, a mental disorder there's therapy counseling medication and support for the individual on an organizational level uh, we have EOT programs. We now have some recognition uh, that this is a, even chronic stress is work related and we have return to work. Uh, and again, I can't stress the importance of recognizing at a tertiary level that something is work related. If we don't recognize it's work related, how are we going to do anything about it? Secondary. Now, mental health first aid doesn't talk a lot about the workplace, but it talks. It can be used as a tool, as the WSPS uh, has mentioned, a as a tool for awareness. It, it, it starts the conversation, it gets people aware of the importance of this. But the elephant in the room, the thing that we're often not talking about, is the primary prevention at the organizational level. And this is where the, we try to develop tools to address this missing gap. So have workplace uh, stress concerns, you know, only recently been discovered? Well, if you go back to a health and safety study uh, in the 1980s, done by SPR, uh, they looked at, I think, four or 5,000 health and safety committees, and, and they filled out surveys, 
that one of the top issues at that time in the 1980s was stress. Uh, the steelworkers in their health and safety and environment conferences for 20, 30 years have asked participants, what are your top issues? Always in the top five has been stress. Uh, until recently, we've denied it, uh, but now Bill 127 is supposed to change that around. But they put it right into legislation. You know, you can get compensated for all kinds of work-related illnesses, but we're not compensating chronic stress. Annalie Yassi, who was a doctor that came out of Hamilton area, and from Hamilton, I work in Hamilton, so uh, it's always important. But uh, she put out a systematic review of the literature on, on joint health and safety committees, and her, of the top 10 issues, uh, number two was the scope of the committee and whether the committees are including psychosocial issues as part of their health and safety. The economic burden. Um, the minister didn't put a, a figure on it, but uh, the uh, Honorable Michael Kirby uh, a few years ago um, stated this, and you can actually watch this on YouTube, that uh, the estimated cost to the, on, to the uh, Canadian economy is $51 billion, and that concludes uh, direct and indirect costs, $20 billion direct costs. And that, that was so big an issue that uh, the Canadian government, which was the Harper government at the time, decided that that was a priority. They had been told by the OECD that can Canada's economy was suffering from a problem with high absenteeism. And when they looked at what was the major cause of absenteeism, it was stress. And so they said, in order to get our economy on our feet, we have to deal with stress. And so they uh, started the process uh, along with the Great West Insurance Company, um, who, who also looks after sickness and accident diseases, and saw that the biggest claims were for stress, and therefore they wanted to put together tools for the employer to reduce those claims. And then uh, also was mentioned Martin Chain, and I won't try to steal his thunder, but uh, he showed that over the years, employers have been more and more be held liable for the psychosocial environment of the workplace. This is not new. Uh, Back in 1989 in the EU, they already passed a directive uh, suggesting that organization of work and social relationships were part of the risk assessment that was required for employers to evaluate their workplaces. And it took a while before that was operationalized, 1993, and they had some struggles at the beginning. It was uh, very vague and uh, they they tried to do things, however, uh, in the last few years, EU members have been passing very specific regulations requiring the quantitative measurement of psychosocial hazards. And in France, if you find a problem, you actually have to show quantitatively that you have solved the problem. So you have to quantitatively assess the hazard, make the intervention, and then reassess to show that you've dealt with it. And they even have... A they started a name and shame <laughs> website, although there was so much shame that they only put the positive things on there and not the negative employers anymore. And in 2012, they had uh, the, the Ministry of Labor inspectors throughout the EU did a blitz on psychosocial uh, assessment, and they produced all kinds of tools, and we'll be handing uh, a couple of those out as examples. In Australia, work-related stress is defined along the job uh, demands and resources model, and they have been compensating uh, uh, stress work-related uh, mental injuries, of which stress is the major uh, part of it, and it currently accounts for 11% of their compensation costs in the province of Victoria, but it's similar in other provinces. And if you... Uh, want to do, learn more, I would recommend this article by Catherine LaPelle, where she goes through the evolution of uh, dealing with compensation and other protections for work-related mental health problems from a Canadian perspective. She has another 
uh, paper which gives an international perspective also, if you're interested. And Bill 127 is going to uh, repeal the current section that does not allow uh, compensation for chronic stress. Uh, however, we have a subsection with look. The exception is that if the uh, stress comes, uh, cannot be associated with uh, the worker's employment, including the decisions to change work to be performed or the working conditions or to discipline. So that gets into a bit of a conundrum. If uh, Val's mad at me for not doing something and she yells at me and starts beating me up, she can say, well, that's part of the, the discipline. And sorry, uh, that's exempt. <laughs> Uh, again, the, the devil is in the details. We'll see how that gets worked out. But uh, What about the Health and Safety Act itself? Uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, some people at, at the uh, Ministry of Labor, and they told me that the general duty clause was not meant to take uh, mental health into consideration, that it was for physical and, and injuries and occupational diseases. Additionally, follow, uh, and they even were worried that maybe they overstepped their bounds with uh, Bill 132 or 168. However, again, you know the WSIV had the challenge. Uh, what would happen if the if the Ministry of Labor interpretation was challenged on the same grounds? I'll leave that as an open question. <laughs> And we met with the Ministry of Labor on this, and we actually, in 2013, asked them, uh, you know, to recognize that psychosocial hazards are co are covered by the general duty clause. Uh, we also asked for some type of uh, uh, guide, and hopefully the stress assess will, will fulfill that role. And also, just like in the EU, to do a blitz on workplaces dealing with uh, with psychosocial hazards. So, and all this came out of a group that met uh, a few years ago, and I want Terry, who's the chairperson of the group, to describe what that's all about. Thanks, John. So some of the context of this uh, comes from my role as a health and safety officer at OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, where I work with OPSU members every day and also workers and, and from other unions and the health and safety officers from every unions in our health and safety offices where we're, we kind of have our fingers on the issues that are going on in workplaces for workers every day. And so back in, before 2009, when we were getting calls from workers, uh, in addition to the traditional health and safety issues about workload, demands, harassment, bullying, work organization, unnecessary tasks, stress, frustration. We knew we needed tools for workplaces to work on this issue. We knew that. And so we would do our work and uh, one day we all found ourselves at a OCAL research conference in 2009. And it was a great conference where it's a multi-stakeholder, so there's employers, system partners, labor, workers, etc. We were there, and at the end of the day, they struck a subcommittee and said, who wants to work on tools for workplaces? They didn't describe a topic, so we all joined a subcommittee. Anyone at that conference could have joined, so employer, anyone who was there, so any stakeholder. So we ended up forming a subcommittee to work on workplace tools. And for us in the labor sector and workers, we thought, hey, this is a chance for us to investigate this black box called stress that we don't have resources on and that the system, you know, we're hearing from the ministry that it's not part of health and safety, although we still take the position it should be part of the general duty clause and that it is. So OCAL, without OCAL, this not never would have happened because their expertise uh, partic from their leadership, but particularly the expertise of John Odyke to lead us through this learning journey that John as just described to you, was like light bulbs going off in our heads. But before we get to that point, we have to decide what topic we're going to work on. So OCAL had a workshop where they said, okay, there's air quality tools, there's ergonomic tools, there's stress tools. Well, we all voted uh, at the meeting and decided on consensus pretty much that we wanted to work on stress tools. So that once we decided that, um, and, and who is and who signed up for this subcommittee to work on workplace tools? Well, about 11 unions, like reps from 11 unions, uh, 
worker organizations such as OCAL, the Office of the Worker Advisor. We had a few people from universities. Um, so we've had, uh, we had a lot of people on the committee, um, but the important thing was that anyone could have joined from that conference. So this has kind of been a journey that has evolved that none of us could have pictured its outcome. Uh, and I don't think we've reached the outcome yet. Um, so then we had in 2000, and we were watching this issue now. Now that we had this subgroup, we watched Martin Shane's report come out in 2010. Two of our committee members, um, Sari Saarinen from Unifor and Laura Lazansky from COT, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, sat on the committee that was developing the standard. We watched the standard start to germinate. We, we had committee members sitting up at that committee. We we're trying to make sure that our learning journey was being reflected at that committee as well, trying to kind of say, hey, we need a bit of a sociological, psychosocial approach, not just psychological. Um, but what we did was John held a workshop and he gave, he put about eight surveys on the tables and asked and said to us, uh, before we had the learning journey, um, okay, if you were going to make a change or an improvement in a workplace, which one of these tools could you do it with? So we had the JCQ, we had the HSE, we had the demand control questionnaires, we had some effort rewards questionnaires, and we had the COPSOT questionnaire. Um, and, we'd, and what we did was we tried them all. We actually did them. He made us fill them all out, right? So what happens when you fill out a survey on one topic is you realize, wow, that's really important, but it's missing all these other topics that are bothering me at work. I think researchers call that face validity. Um, but anyway, so what we discovered, uh, so he did that with us before he led us on this journey. But the minute he said to us, you know, some of these things, light bulbs were going off, we're going, yes, we see what the approach should be. Yes, we see how we can make change in a workplace. And so it led us to the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire, which I like to describe it as a questionnaire that incorporates all the research buckets on workplace stress, and Fergal uh, described them, you know, demand control, effort reward, justice and respect, um, undesirable behaviors, right? Because it, if it includes it all, um, then a worker isn't going to, a workplace isn't going to start to find what it can work on and find some topics missing, right? Um, so we found that it was a validated tool that was developed in Denmark from researchers at universities who worked in collaboration with the labor groups out there. And they had piloted it, not just in one country, but in many countries. And they had developed a Danish population sample um, of about 4,000 workers from general categories, and they had validated it over there. So we thought, well, you know, we need to try it over here. Um, so let's try it. Well, let's, first of all, it did cover all of the research buckets, as you will. So it has, you know, demands, but it looks at quantitative pace and emotional demands, which we saw from Fergal's presentation are very important in today's workplaces. Um, or work organization, influence and control over work, meaning of work, etc. possibilities for development, relationships at work, you know, and that, that means through all levels, is work predictable, is our role clear, um, how much support does the organization give? What's the leadership? How, how are they supportive? Do they, you know, what commitment do they have to this issue? Supervisor supports, because there's lots of research that talks about the importance of the direct supervisor support. Supervisors are often the ones caught in the middle who want to support, but are constrained themselves. Um, trust, justice and respect. And I was really happy I could have hugged Fergal when he had the slides about procedural and all the different kinds of justice because those matter, right? Those matter in a workplace. That's where the cop sock gets into work values. Work-life balance matters. The degree to which an organization sets itself up to be conducive to work and family life is important. I had a job before the one I have now where I had to have 30 days notice to get a day off where I was denied. If I applied 29 and three quarters days in advance, I was denied. But yet this workplace had a pool of workers that fill in. So that, that's an example of a cost-free change that a workplace could make to make things easier for work-life balance. So those are the kinds of interventions 
our MIT group was after, not saying, oh, poor Terry, she's stressed, trying to struggle working home. Let's give her some yoga at lunch. Um, I love yoga at lunch, but it doesn't solve that problem. Um, and also the undesirable behaviors or offensive behaviors that we lumped together. Now the bucket, you know, we had to add, after trying to use the cop suck ourselves, we had to add, John will get into what we added, I think. No, we had to add discrimination. You know, we had to make sure vicarious was covered because, you know, you want face validity in this. So through our piloting of it, we decided, our workers were telling us where the gaps were. We had to add physical safety to it, but then again, so did the standard, right? Because that wasn't in the cop sock. And the cop sock has added physical safety since, I, don't, I think, eh, John? Or they're going to. But anyway, we piloted it at union conferences because this is a working group, you know, that gathered to discover on this issue. We found a questionnaire that we thought well represented the groups. Um, there's other questionnaires out there, um, but the one with the standard, for instance, doesn't ask questions about workplace violence, just workplace civility. And if you're a healthcare worker getting bought and, and attacked in an EA, getting kicked and bit and punched, you know, you need a survey that can get at some of that too. Um, we piloted it at the steelworkers, John piloted it with the steelworkers at the steelworkers conference where there was lots of people there to give responses. And again, when we were piloting it, we were piloting it in the cop sock format. And then the workers there said, hey, this might be missing or that might be missing. And so it was a bumpy uh, road, but... Uh, but we've had different pilots over a numbers of years that have, have made the product grow. So we piloted at the OPSU Broader Public Sector Conference in 2011, where we had 180 people. And this is an issue near and dear to the hearts of all workers in the broader public sector, as well as all workers, because they do jobs that deal with people. Um, and so we had uh, piloted it there. And then the CAW Unifor now piloted at their women's conference in Port Elgin in uh, 2011. And so based on all these pilots, and, and again, with OCOW's help, we were able to figure out different ways to do the reports because we've experimented with how to report. We ended up with a long report for the steering committee, people who want more information, and a short report for general distribution to give the punchline to folks about what the issues were and, and steps that could be taken. And uh, so we presented the results of those um, pilots at a session at uh, Labor OCAL Academic Research Collaboration, or LORC, we call it. It's basically a collaboration of researchers, uh, organizations, and, and labor that we work on, you know, health and safety, and we think about health and safety and compensation and how uh, the landscape, how the, we can make improvements in both of those. And so we've had a number of teach-ins that we run at various places. We had one at McMaster. Uh, this one was at Ottawa, where we talked about stopping the spread of psychosocial hazards at work in Quebec and Ontario. And a lot of, we had representation from Quebec and heard about their experience dealing with psychosocial hazards. So after piloting it at these big union conferences, the unions working with it with small locals and workplaces who wanted to use it, um, we developed, uh, you know, the version and it's evolved up to now where, you know, we never weren't thinking of an app back then, but we had developed an online toolkit during this time. We wanted it to be online because we wanted workers to be able to click to the resources that are in Europe mostly on, you know, what do you do to address these things? So there's lots of resources in Europe. So we launched that online toolkit in Sudbury at the E-Dome on October 10th, 2012. And the kit was basically envisioned by the MIT committee as a one-stop shop for workers to pick up, work for workers and workplaces to pick up learn what is this thing about called workplace stress what are the perspectives about it what are the approaches to it what does the law say about it that was a very short section especially at that time <laughs> um, and uh, an action plan what can we do in a workplace or what can we do as a worker um, to move this thing forward and to fix these issues that are going on in workplaces and so it, it's not pretty it, it's not 
graphically designed. It was written by health and safety geeks, uh, workers and union f and workers and organizations. Um, we develop the content and we use it to try to engage employers in workplaces. Uh, and, and many have taken it up and have been engaged. And later I'll tell you a little bit about some of our use with it on the ground. But that eDome event in 2012 was about two months prior to the standard release in January of 2013. And we had, you know, like much like this, we had 80 people in the room and we had uh, another couple of hundred online and one doctor as far away as United Arab Emirates. Anyway, I'll call John back up to get into um, the progress today because don't forget John's work on this uh, you know, he is the one of the con Oak House, the contact for Ontario, so they have a scope of uh, involvement in this that goes beyond just what the unions have been participating in. Okay, so so far we've done uh, over 90 workplaces, we've collected uh, from them uh, 8,300 surveys. We've also, in addition to those three union conferences, we've done five others uh, for a total of another 1,400 surveys. Uh, 54 of those workplaces came from uh, Terry's union where they did a, a campaign in one of the uh, sectors. Uh, also, we did a cross Canada poll that I alluded to earlier and had over 4,100. So uh, we've almost got 14,000 responses so far. Uh, and we've had actually uh, three workplaces who have done the second set of uh, surveys. So that's really interesting to see how you measure it at a benchmark and then you uh, measure it again and we'll have um, someone talk about that later. And uh, we're also, we have a, a new version of the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire that's just being beta tested right now and we're one of the organizations. It goes back to 97 and right now we're in the third version and hopefully uh, it will be released next year. I don't think it will be released this year. <laughs> when I first did this slide, I had 2015 on there, and it keeps getting <laughs> getting pushed back. As Terry said, uh, a lot of what what the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire tries to do is take all the different theories, some of the ones Fergal was talking about, and put them all into a single uh, uh, survey. So it's one tool for everything. Some of the new things that we're adding is role conflict. Uh, you sometimes have to do things which ought to have been done in a different way, or uh, you sometimes have to do things which seem unnecessary. <laughs> Val's looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I, I should be looking at the Ministry of Labor because she blames them. <laughs> uh, social support from colleagues, a sense of community, insecurity over employment, insecurity over working conditions. And what was called in, in, in Spain, double presence. Uh, there's sometimes that you have to be both at work and at home to deal with things at the same time and the conflict distress at that time. So, as I said, we were using Danish reference uh, data, so uh, people wanted us to use Canadian reference data. Although, you know, as the minister says, if we're going to be the best, we have to be better than the Danes because when they do studies about who's the happiest, the Danish people always come out on top. So, Anyway, so we, we did a cross-Canada survey using a polling company. And some of the results, uh, I'll show these uh, these dashboard views there. And I've colored the results by the, uh, the best is, is the darkest green, the worst is the darkest red, and the yellow is somewhere in between. So for this one, job security is good. Uh, mining was the worst and uh, public administration is the best and somewhere in between you see the orange ones construction manufacturing it uh, arts and entertainment you, you can understand why that would be quite insecure uh, looking at some of the quantitative demands uh, if you look at the first column there you see that it work uh, has some of the the highest ratings for quantitative demands. For work pace, however, we have accommodation and food services. When we get to emotional demands, we get health care and social assistance, uh, followed closely by uh, educational services. So you can see how the different sectors add up. Um, 
Then we look at some of the offensive behaviors, uh, undesired sexual attention. Remember, this is cross-section of working Canadians that's meant to be representative of the total population. And what we see is that the retail trade, uh, followed by accommodation and food and uh, administrative waste management and media services are the top three. By the way, that one, I don't know who cooked up that, uh, that category. It includes um, um, security guards, call center workers, and uh, garbage collectors. <laughs> I don't know who put them all together. The lowest one on the list here, uh, you see at 7% is manufacturing, which uh, I was kind of surprised at because coming out of a manufacturing background myself, I remember the abuse that I got. <laughs> Uh, in comparison to the Danes, however, they're at 2.9%. So what does that say about using Canadian averages as our, our benchmark? Uh, I'm not sure. But if we're going to be the best in the world, we're not there yet. What about physical violence? Here again, uh, health care and social assistance are, are the, the highest one, um, followed by educational services and the home sales rate. Uh, again, the Danish population is 3.9%. The only group lower than that are the professional, scientific, and technical services. I think that's me, right? <laughs> <laughs> this one, the bullying, was quite a surprise. Uh, mining is uh, just enormously uh, out of whack with all the other ones. But uh, the other ones at the high end are health care, arts, our uh, accommodation and food services and public administration. Uh, public administration surprised me there. But this was quite dramatic. The Canadian average is 31% and the Danish average is 8.3%, almost a four times more. So what's the difference between Danish society and Canadian society that, that would account for the difference in bullying? And um, I, I have uh, European roots and uh, uh, actually more family there than here and, and go there fairly often. And the, the, just personally, anecdotally, what I see is uh, there be, uh, there's a lot more collaboration, the importance on working together. Uh, they're, all, they're on a very, my family comes from Holland, which is the most densely populated uh, country in Europe and so everybody's on top of each other so they better get along uh, whereas we in the, the West or in, in North America seem to appreciate you know the individual with the strong initiative um, uh, the aggressiveness and I think that has an implication I'm not you know I'm not a sociologist maybe Fergal can uh, uh, put us all on the couch and give us the diagnosis but uh, <laughs> It's an interesting observation. Another question we asked is, to what extent would you agree that this organization tolerates behavior that harms mental health of those who work here? And uh, what we found is when you combine them, uh, over a third of workers in Canada have organizations that tolerate uh, uh, behaviors that are harmful to mental health. And then we also ask questions about symptoms. And when we look at uh, the symptom score, as we lay this a lot of information, but maybe look at the top five there, these are the top five ish issues that predict how people will uh, rate the tolerance of harmful behavior. So it's a lack of justice and respect, a lack of trust, lack of predict predictability, uh, problems with role conflict, and a lack of support from... Uh, you know, and when we look to, uh, you know, what is the cost to, to uh, fix these things? Do you have to buy an expensive ventilation system? Do you have to make changes to the process to make it ergonomically more sound and buy more equipment? Well, a lot of these things are free. They don't cost money. Justice and respect, that doesn't cost money. Uh, trust, that doesn't cost money. These are things that are in our relationship. Predictability and role conflicts, that's a lot of organization, uh, how we arrange what we do within our organization. Social support. So, uh, We also did a qualitative analysis, and I think I'm going to skip quickly to just 
a flavor of some of the comments. It's a good place to, to work, but management can be hard to fun, but it's fun. I work for an amazing organization that does great work. The workload for managers is off the chart. There's great appreciation, however, that the work can't be completed in a regular day. Most of my dissatisfaction comes from my manager. If he wasn't the manager, the answers to the questions would be quite different. In the past, with different managers, I have quite high job satisfaction. And then uh, probably the most stress. Highly stressful, work overload, no clarity in role and responsibility leads to duplication between corporate branches, bullying, no support from management, always worried about losing the job and unable to find another one and not eligible to get eligible for it. Um, the comments really give you the human side of the statistics, which uh, I sat down and read them all in one day, and I, I was quite overwhelmed, or 1,100. So the question is, uh, how can we address these issues? And this was the question that the Mental Injury Tool Group and they came up with this list of tools that are on the website. Uh, there's a guy that Terry talked about the survey. We've got uh, YouTube videos, posters. The things in brackets here in the link highlighted are things that we're working on. Uh, the online survey administration is the stress assessed. That uh, we've talked about. And uh, this is the app. And if what we're going to do now is uh, we ask people to uh, kind of get together in groups. Uh, maybe some of the people in the, the, the stands up there can come around the tables and, and work together. Uh, I, there might not be enough. But uh, anyway, so we're going to pass out the survey. Yeah, that one. And ask you to do it because the best way to really get the feel for it is to do it yourself. Now, for those of you who have uh, cell phones, this is your chance to pull it out and use it. You can download the app. If you go to uh, either uh, the, the Apple Store, uh, Google Play, or the BlackBerry, and if you do a search for measure workplace stress, uh, it should come up. And the nice thing about doing it on the app as opposed to the paper is when you do it on the app, you get uh, the scoop. The scoring is done for you, and also you can click on these little eye icons and get some ideas on how to fix the problem um, that you've identified. And for the second part of the workshop, uh, we're going to uh, talk about brainstorming some of the solutions to, to some of these problems. So if you want to uh, do that, so um, what time is it? So uh, it will take, uh, let's say, five to ten minutes for you to uh, either fill it out on the app or... Uh... For those of you doing it on the paper... For those of you, well, for those of you online, um, I believe Linda has put the, uh, these items up. There's about four items that you can download. Uh, the first two... Uh, 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 first of all, the, the questionnaire itself, uh, with numbered, for instance, uh, question 1A and 1B, do you often, or do you get behind uh, with your work? Uh, I often do, so that's a three for me. And do you often not have time to complete your task? Uh, again, that's often for me. So two and two, or three and three is six. So I put a six in that box, and then on the uh, score sheet, if you open that up, there's numbers for each uh, double question, like quantitative work demands. If I circle the six, or three, three, six, so I circle that, and I'm in red, and it tells me I'm in trouble. Yes, uh, if you look at support, uh, for instance, I'm also uh, in the green.
that's the right one. That's the old one, right? Not the new one. Thank you.